theyeshiva.net. It was October 30th, 2014. Mendy called me a few months earlier and asked me if I would come speak at a special fundraising evening for the Telzer Yeshiva here in Cleveland. I said it would be my honor and my privilege to speak for Tells. He said, good, and you're staying in my home. Reject all invitations. Great. He picked me up from the airport, brought me to his home. His Aisha Schael welcomed me, treated me like a king. Mendy told me, a real guest is the one who's comfortable opening the pantries, opening the refrigerator, opening the freezer. I don't want to serve you. Take whatever you want, and I'll serve you in addition to that. We went to the beautiful dinner, to the beautiful evening for tells, and I was told by the organizers, I was told by the guests, I have to give a very short speech. Why? They said tonight is LeBron James' homecoming to Cleveland. He's going to be playing, and nobody in that crowd can afford to miss the game. Maybe the Telzer Rosh Hashiva Reb David. I'm not sure you'll have to ask him. Depends where he grew up. But they said, nobody in the audience can afford to miss the game. And with all due respect to you, Rabbi YY, between you and LeBron James, despite your good looks, he will triumph. Okay? I was Mitzvah V'Oimid. I stuck to the time frame. I cut out 99% of the speech. I just left in the jokes. That's all they cared about. And I had some message also. I spoke about the miracle of tells, tells in Europe, tells in the United States, the miracle of survival of Torah. And then we went home. Now, eschatoy animaskir hayoyim, I have to mention my sin today. Even though I'm an American kid, I'm a Brooklyn kid, I did not know who LeBron James was. I hope you don't throw me out of Cleveland for eternity, but I didn't know. We came home, I thought, I'm going to get to hit the sack because I was exhausted and I had an early flight. Mendy says, you got to watch the game. <laughs> you have to watch the game. No, call Masha Balabayis Aymalacha Asay Chutz Mitzay, including watching a basketball game, especially when it's Cleveland, especially when it's a homecoming, especially when it's LeBron James. I was upset, but I was happy and gracefully fulfilled the tzivui of the Balabayas. As it happens to be, it was one of his worst performances ever. If I'm not mistaken, you can Google it. They say that it was Mamish one of the worst. It was an embarrassment for him and his Zaydas <laughs> and Babas. Mendy says, eh, you should have spoken longer. <laughs> should have spoken much longer. You should have gone for two hours. It's a waste of time. But in the middle of the game, when Mendy was still davening and praying and beseeching the Almighty and LeBron to do a little better and make his hometown proud, I asked him why he wanted I should watch this game with him. Couldn't have he hired somebody else for company during, <laughs> during a basketball game? I mean, this was an expensive, an expensive endeavor just to have me watch, watch basketball with you. And he said, Rabbi, it's important for you to know what's happening in the real world if you want to reach the hearts of real children. Okay, got it. I come back to New York, and I think one or two days later, I'm speaking to a large group of teenagers struggling heavily with Yiddishkeit very heavily with Yiddishkeit. 
and I address them. I speak about life, I speak about love, I speak about meaning, I speak about dignity, I speak about self-esteem, I speak about Judaism, I speak about integrity, I speak about honesty. And one of the teenagers, creative, fresh, says, Rabbi Jacobson, you know nothing about the real world. Nothing. You don't understand anything about our interests. I say, really? Who was in Cleveland for LeBron James' homecoming? <laughs> I was there, and I was one of his worst, and I went through the whole game because I was really, Mendy was teaching me. He was a tutor, he was a good Rosh Hashiva when it came to some areas in life. And he was explaining to me everything that is happening, including how bad he was. And I gave them a wonderful lecture about the horrible game and how LeBron James embarrassed Cleveland. I was there, I ran away the next morning out of shame and feeling empathy and compassion for the community. And I almost became, I'm not gonna say I became a LeBron James to those kids, but close to a celebrity for those children. And it underscored once again the unique soul, heart, and personality of Mendy Klein, hard to say, of blessed memory, who, in two words in English, I would say, he got it. And what do I mean when I say he got it? There are a lot of wise, good, fine, honest, religious, holy, saintly, observant, scholarly members of the Hebrew tribe today. But many of us don't get it. And the best way, perhaps, to describe it is with the following extraordinary tale in Gemara, Meseches Baba Basra, Dafyudam at Beis. The Gemara says, Rabbi Yosef, the son of Rabbi Yeshua, fell deathly ill, and he had what we would call a near death experience. Ingid, Chalish. And when he comes back to life, his father asks him, what did you see on the other side? And he says, I saw an upside down world. Those who down here are the machers, they're superior, what we call in Brooklyn the feinschmeckers. Up there, hmm, they're in steerage, in the Titanic steerage. And those who are tachtoinim, there may be a very low caliber over there, they're Lamaila. That's the end of the story in Gemara. What's the point? Who did he see? Who was he talking about? I once told the story, somebody says, without names, who was it? <laughs> so Tysus, you want to know, what did he see? Who did he see? I want to know who he saw. So Tysus, without names, tells us who it was. And Tysus was there, Baba Basra says, we have a tradition from Rabbeinu Hananel, Ish mi pi ish, Rebbe mi pi Rebbe, till the Goinim. Very unusual expression for the Bali HaToysvus. A tradition, the way to the Goinim, it was two people he saw. One man named Rabbi Yehuda, and the other man named Shmuel. What did he see? Toysvus references a Gemara Meseches Babebas, Meseches Shabbos. The Gemara says in Shabbos that Shmuel was sitting in his Bezdin and his student Rabbi Yehuda was there. And a broken woman came in and started to what we would call in Yiddish kvetch and kvetch and kvetch. And Shmuel ignored her. But he ignored her. So his student Rabbi Yehuda says, Loy sover leimar, my teacher, doesn't remember a verse in Proverbs and Mishle, Oitim, Oznoim, Izak, Azdal. How challenging, how serious, how painful it is for Hashem when somebody plugs his ear from the cry of the downtrodden. So Shmuel turns to his student. He says, Reishach Bekriri, Reishach Reishach Bachamimi. You think I'm going to get penalized? I'm not the boss here. I'm going to get a cold pot of cholent on my head. 
I got a boss, Marukva. He's the head of the court. He's going to get the hot pot of cholent on his head. He's the boss. I don't run the show here. I work here. End of story. Who was right? Marukva, Shmur, Rabbi Yehuda. The Gemara leaves us in limbo. But not really. In Baba Basra, Toysva says, Rabbi Yosef goes up and he sees an upside down world. What was the upside down world? Shmuel was the Rebbe. Rabbi Yehuda was the student. But up there, Rabbi Yehuda was the Rebbe. And Shmuel was the student. Oilam hafuch. That's the upside down world. Why? Why was Shmuel the student? Because Rabbi Yehuda taught him this verse. Don't plug your ear from the cry of the downtrod. Now I asked you a question. Shmuel was the Rebbe, the mentor, the teacher of Rabbi Yehuda for decades. Shmuel was the mentor and teacher of Bovel of Nahardov for decades. Shmuel was one of the greatest sages of the generation. Nihirinli shvili de rakia, kishvili de nahardor. The pathways of heaven are as clear to me as the pathways of nahardor. How much Torah did he teach Rabbi Yehuda? Taught him everything. Rabbi Yehuda taught him one pasuk in Mishlei. That's why in the next world, Rabbi Yehuda is the Rebbe Shmuel is the teacher. Where's justice? You taught somebody for decades and decades, and then they told you one verse. The answer, of course, my dearest friends, is another Gemara in Shabbos, Lamed Aleph. The non-Jew comes to Hillel, teach me all of Judaism, standing on one foot. How long can you stand on one foot for? 40 seconds, 30 seconds. I want the whole of Yiddishkeit, all I tell you on one leg, on one foot. And Hillel says, I got it. The whole Torah is what you dislike to be done to you, don't do it to anybody else. That is the whole Torah. Everything else is commentary on this statement. Now, go study the commentary. What was Hillel saying? Hillel was saying this. I could learn Zvachim and finish Zvachim and Menachus and Chulim. I could know Baba Basra with all the Toysmus. I could know Shabbos with all the Marachas and Makiva Eger. I could know Nezikin and Noshim. Zroyim and Moyed, and I can even know every Mishnah in Kalim, Olus, and Egoyim, and Uktin. If I don't see in every line of Rashi, Toysvus, Rajber, Ramban, and Ritva, in every Maram Shif, and in every Masho, in every Reb Chaim, and in every Birch Shmuel, if I don't see in every line that it's a commentary on Avas Yisrael, it's mamish like learning Toysvus, without learning the Gemara. There are people who do that. <laughs> there are Bachrim. <laughs> they learn about Kiva Hege, they don't yet know what the Mishnah says. But everyone knows it's not a way of learning. It's a fakrumta way of learning. It makes you miserable. If I learn I'm a sugin l'shmoyo l'shmo, and I'm a chlif parabachamor, and l'shem shish and dvarim, and I don't get that it's a commentary on Avas Yisrael, on being there for another person, I missed it. I didn't get it. Shmuel taught Rabbi Yehuda the whole Torah, but he taught him the commentary on Torah. Rabbi Yehuda taught his Rebbe Kivayochel Torah. He taught him, don't plug your ear from the cry of the downtrodden person. Oitim Oznoi Mizakas Dal. I was recently in Eretz Yisrael in Bnei Brak, and a Jew there, an old time Bnei Brak shared with me the following episode. The Panovich Yerov, Zechit Tzadik Levracher of Kahnman, was earlier mentioned by the Rosh Koylo Shlita, was a brilliant, brilliant leader, activist, and also great fundraiser. He went to South Africa once, and he came to a Jew who was anti-religious, and he asked him to fund an orphanage for Holocaust survivors, children. And the man said, no problem with a condition. You don't raise them with yamulkas or tzitzis. The Panovich Yerov agreed. He got from him $1 million in the 1950s. 
He gave him a handshake. His student says, Rebbe, how could you promise this to him? He says, I didn't lie. He went to Bnei Brook and he built an orphanage for girls. <laughs> there was no yarmulke and there were no tzitzis. These were all children, survivors of the war, whom he raised in one of his bateyavis in one of his orphanages in Bnei Brook. And so the girls grew up. This was their home. This was their environment. This was the place where they learned to live and love. And Friday night they would have their meals. And one Friday night, they're singing. They're having their meal and they're singing. Of course, there's a neighbor. There's always a neighbor. And the neighbor comes running to the Ponovich And he says, Rebbe, this is not fair. Friday night, and I hear girls singing. It's not Sneas, Kol Beisha. got to stop this. Ponovich said, what do you want me to do? Tell the girls they can't sing. There's neighbors around. Panovich Yerov says, this is a serious question. I can't just tell that to the girls. And he goes to the Chazonish. And he tells the story to the Chazonish. And he starts telling the story. There's the orphanage of the girls. And Friday night after the meal, they sing. He wants to finish the story and ask a question. The Chazonish interrupts the Panovich Yerov. And he says in Yiddish, Zei zingen? The Maidlach Zingen, Azab Surya Toiva, they can and shine Zingen. Ah! Ich bin Azay Zufrieden Saharan. These girls are singing. Wow. They reached a place in life where they're capable of singing, of celebrating life, of celebrating Shabbos, of celebrating love, of celebrating friendship. Wow. That warms my heart. The Panovich Yerov couldn't finish the question. Now there's always going to be a nudnik who's going to ask me, what is he supposed to do? Well, he could have gone to Yerushalayim for Shabbos, <laughs> come to Cleveland for Shabbos, or, or he could have gone to the base Madrish and learned till 2 o'clock in the morning, and he would have saved his holy, saintly soul. So you see, friends, there are people who know a lot of information, but they don't get it. Oitem oznoi mizaakas dal. It's maybe, one can't say, the Rambam in Pirisha Mishnai says every word is identical in its sacredness. But it's certainly one of the most haunting psukim in all of Chumash, in Parshas Miketz. And when I think of men decline, this comes up in my mind. Vayoy Ruven. Ruven tells his brothers, Haloyamarti Aleichem Lamer, Al Techtu Vayeled, Vigam Hine, Vigam Domo Hine Nidrash. Remember the scene. Yosef throws his brothers into prison with the accusation of espionage. 21 years after they sold him, they're now prisoners. And they look to each other, and what do they say? We're guilty. Why? For our brother. We have seen the distress of his soul when he begged. When he pleaded with us for mercy, when we threw him into the pit. We did not listen to him. That's why we have this challenge. That's why we have this tzara. The first time we know that Yosef was begging for compassion. We never knew it. In the story, we never knew it. But here we know he was begging. We didn't listen. We plugged our ears. That's why we are being accused of espionage. That's why we are being thrown into a prison. What are the brothers doing? They're expressing remorse, regret. They're doing tshuva. They're saying we were wrong. We were deaf. We were kevayachal, cruel. We were apathetic. We were indifferent. The shamanu, we weren't listening to the cry of our baby brother. We thought we were right, and we didn't listen to his cry. What would be your response? If you were there, what would be your response? 
What do you think is the response? They're regretting it. They're doing tshuva. They feel bad. They want to correct it. They feel horrible. They realize, They realize this is why they're having this tzara. What's the appropriate response? What would you say? Maybe encourage them, inspire them, tell them Hashem accepts tshuva. Let's go look for him. Let's pray for him. Let's do whatever we can. Let's turn over the world. No. Reuven says a classic Jewish conversation. I told you. I'll take you by yelling. I told you. Reuven, it's 21 years ago. That's your only message. I told you. Your older brother is right. And God is demanding his blood. Reuven, what's your point? We got it. No, we made a horrible mistake. No, I'm going to add a little salt to your wound. They were feeling so guilty. And you know Jews, you're Jews. You know what Jewish guilt is. Right? The Jewish telegram. Start worrying. Details to follow. The definition of a Jew is if he doesn't feel guilty, he blames himself. <laughs> but here they were feeling guilty. He, he really had to impose more Jewish guilt. Haloya <sighs> Marty. But the answer is very profound. And it captures so much of our times. You know what they were saying? They were saying, look what happened to us. Look at this tzara. We're in a cell in a dungeon accused of a blood libel. We are not spies. We came to buy food. We're innocent people. Why did this happen? Why did Hashem do this? I'll tell you why. We made a mistake. We sinned. We didn't listen to our brother. It was the tzara. It was the consequences. It was the tragedy that happened to them that broke them. That suddenly made them wake up. Reuven, who the Medrash says is the Paiseach B'tshuva. He is the first Baal Tshuva in Chumash. Because of his own Kivayachal, his own mistakes relative to their levels, of course. We're dealing with Shifte Yutke. Koloim, Reuven, Chate, and Yalatoyer, and Shabbos. But we're talking relative to their great level. Reuven told the Shvatim, No! Halo Yamarti Aleichem Leimer Al Techtu Bayelet! Don't focus on the Tzara that's happening to you. Focus on the child. You're still not getting it. You were caught. You were shattered. You were broken. It's like, oh my God, how do I get out of this? I must have made a terrible mistake. Let me fix it. You're not thinking about the child. Stop thinking about your Ganeiden, your Gehenna, your reward, your punishment. Think about the child. Don't be a spiritual narcissist. Think about the child who's in a pit. Think about the child who's in the abyss. Think about the downtrodden young man or woman abused for years. One cover up and another cover up. And some people say, oi, 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 there's a tsara coming. The government is cracking down. The attorney general is cracking down. Today the media exposes everything. Today people go to the police. We got to do something. Mendy said, you, make, you lost it. You missed the point. It's not about the tzara. It's not about somebody catching you. It's not about exposure. It's not about closing down your school or your community. Al techtu bayeled. Do you know what the child went through? Do you know what these children are going through? Does anybody have the heart and the soul to stop thinking about their own spiritual or physical protectia. And focus on the child. That was Mendy Klein. Vigam That's something else. God demands the blood. That's a vigam. But first, tune into the child. Very rare to have a person who's affluent, successful, quite busy, and yet 24 hours a day, 
if I or anybody else phoned them. There's a girl in Lakewood. There's a boy in Muncie. There's a girl in Yerushalayim. There's a teenager in B'nai Brak. There's a youngster in Borough Park, in Williamsburg, in Chicago, in Toronto, in London, in Manchester, wherever it is, from Melbourne to Los Angeles. And this is what they're dealing with. This is what type of home they have. This is what happened in school. This is what's happening. Many people will say, it's three in the morning, let's think about it. By Mendy Klein, there was no, let's think about it. You got a call before Alois HaShachar, after Alois HaShachar. Whether you davened Vesikin or you went to sleep before Vesikin, he was up. Somehow he was up. Rabbi Waiwa, what are we doing about it? What are we doing about it? Within a few hours, he had six of the leaders of the community of that particular neighborhood on the phone. This can't go on. Al techtu bayeled. You know, the Jewish community is awesome and enormous. I don't have to tell you, Micha Amcha Yisrael, Goyachad Baretz. One of our challenges is we're not always honest with ourselves. We're not always ready to confront our demons, our skeletons, our ghosts. It's not comfortable. It's much easier to get up at a pulpit and celebrate our success, and we should. But those Yosef HaTzadiks who are lingering in the abyss are an oila mole, bonim atim l'ashem alekeichem. And if you had a huge mishpacha, but you had one child in the abyss, you can't sleep. And the success of hundreds of thousands of Moisdes HaTayr of HaChesed doesn't cancel out the fact that youngsters are murdered emotionally and spiritually the ain points a pearl mitzvah safe because who wants to confront skeletons in the closet save Mendy Klein who scream day in and day out al tachtu bayeled and it expressed itself whether through amudim or whether through thousands and thousands of emails campaigns and most importantly I don't know if there's one soul in this world suffering. And an email was sent to Mendy Klein, and he did not send the contribution, what I saw from the emails, between five and $25,000 for her recovery, for her therapy, for saving a family, and so forth. You know, in many ways, I always saw him as the man who stood in between two realities. This Pasuk always makes me emotional about Aaron, the sweet Kairach. Vayamoid Aaron ben Achayim or ben Hamesim. Vateotzer Hamagefa. Aaron stood between the living and the dead. What does this mean? Who lives between the living and the dead? Ben Hamesim or ben Achayim. Mendy shared with me more than once, how his mother was in the gas chambers in Auschwitz twice. Once, the gas chambers malfunctioned. The second time, the Red Cross made a surprise visit. Twice inside the gas chambers. His father refused to go on the death march in January 45, when the SS marched out the Muslim for a 35 mile march. They said, you will be shot. Better to be shot in a barrack than on the street, on a road. And a Luftwaffe soldier protected him a whole night till four in the morning when the Soviet tanks rolled into Auschwitz-Birkenau. He never took that for granted. Therefore, he never took his wife for granted, his children for granted, Jewish life for granted, a Shabbos for granted, a Yom Tov for granted, blessing, success, and wealth for granted. He always stood, Bein HaMesim or Bein HaChayim. There are those who remain behind, depressed, broken Jews. You can't blame them. There are those of us who said, it's time to move on. Mendy stood right in the middle. He knew how to enjoy life. 
His close friends here know very well, men decline. If you went with him, you had a good time. We spent many Pesachs, and he cheered up a lot, a lot of the people. He knew how to live. He had a geschmacke taste for life. But he never took life for granted. He stood in the vortex, in the middle line, Ben Hamesim, or Ben Hachayim, and therefore he always remembered he has one task, Vate Otzer Hamagefa, to put a stop to all of the epidemics, all of the plagues that haunt us. Lies, dishonesty, abuse, cover-ups, molestation, apathy, narcissism, indifference, selfishness, and fragmentation, dispute, disrespect, machloikas, and I should say stupidity, and the lack of common sense to who we are, where we are, and what are the dangers that really face us. The blessing of Mendy Klein was, at the end of every telephone conversation, and there were many, he would call me up, just came back from Israel, this is what I heard. Rabbi YY, make a plan, I'm gonna get it done. Okay, I'm gonna get him on the phone, give me three minutes, I'm gonna get him on the phone, I want you to speak to him. You give me a plan, and I'll get it done. And he would finish every conversation, Rabbi YY, we're gonna change it. We're gonna change it. Always, we're going to change it. Never paralysis, despair. We are Jews who love kvetching. Oi, 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 oi. Mendy Klein gave a little oi, and then it's like, we're going to change it. And it reminds us of that moment at the end of Marcus. They see a fox coming out of the Holy of Holies, and everybody's crying. For good reason. Rabbi Akiva is laughing. And they say, why are you laughing? And as a good Jew, he says, why are you crying? You don't answer. You ask a question. And they say, why? We're crying. The holiest place in the world. There are foxes. Rabbi Akiva is laughing. He sees a different vision. What is going on here? One of the great interpretations I heard from my Rebbe was this. They were crying because the foxes are coming out. Why a fox? Why not a rat? Why not a weasel? Why not a mouse? You'll say, But in Torah, everything is precise, including a detail. We know from Brachas, Rabbi Akiva, the Gemara discusses the fox as Pikeach Shebechayis, the brilliant one among the animals, the wise one. Rabbi Akiva is the one who says that. And suddenly there's the fox coming out of Kodesh HaKadosh. The Jewish youth, their Chachma, their Pikchus, has been substituted with Kodesh Shakab, has been substituted by other things in lieu of Kodesh HaKadoshim. Instead of finding their wisdom and inspiration and depth in the Holy of Holies, in Torah and Yerushalayim, they are leaving Kodesh HaKadoshim in the droves. There's a new reality facing the Jewish people. They're looking for their wisdom, for their Pikchus Bechayos. Outside of the Holy of Holies. How could you not cry? So Rabbi Akiva looked at his colleagues. And he understood why you should cry. He himself ripped his garments. But Rabbi Akiva was communicating a message. And the message was, the youth are leaving Kodesh HaKadoshim. Gay brings a in Kodesh HaKadoshim. Go and bring them back into the Holy of Holies. Vos why are you crying? Go out with joy and passion and oomph and enthusiasm and bring them back into the Holy of Holies. No Jew will be left behind. No Jew needs to be left behind. But you can only do it with a smile, with zest, with simcha. Young people want passion, creativity, Depth, meaning, chiyus, love, simcha, sachayim. Not a heavy Judaism, a beautiful, meaningful, inspiring, elevated Judaism. That was Mendy Klein's dream. Don't sit and kvetch about all the problems. Get to work and bring them back into Kodesh HaKadoshim. And you can only do it with love. You can only do it with a lot of joy, with a lot of simcha.
We all know it's quite sad to be gathered here for Mendy Kleinschlisch. He would not, he would not appreciate long speeches, certainly not about him. Mendy Klein didn't give speeches, nor did he like other people giving speeches. As a speaker, I know this very, very well. What would Mendy say if he was here? Say, okay, Rabbi, why, why? Be quiet. Let's go. Let's move on. Let's get to work. Stop. I have important things to do. And yet, we are here commemorating the life of a unique, unique person. As they say, they don't make him that way. And in this case, it's not a cliché. You can't replicate him. You can't clone him. You can't find people like him. His ability to look at a 17-year-old teenager struggling with drugs, begovainayim. You know what begovainayim means? How do you say it in English? Eye to eye. No pompousness, not a bone of judgmentalism. And you know, we, we're good people, but we know how to be judgmental. Especially if you don't daven my nusach. Especially if you don't wear my hat. Especially if you didn't go to my yeshiva. Especially if you don't mamish, mamish, mamish get my mahalach. And especially if you're not part of my chalois. We could be judgmental. Mendy Klein was a successful person. He did not have a bone of judgmentalism. He could go into a group a bunch of teenage girls, or another group, a bunch of teenage boys, struggling, tattoos, earrings, communion ramach, piercings, communion shasa, and nobody felt holier than thou. Come on, bums. He was right there. Ben Chaim or Ben with them, in tuned, connected, heart to heart, soul to soul. He got it. He got it. He understood that Torah, that Judaism ultimately is not about self-perfection. It's about transcending the self. So haben geschmack in Toivet on Aiden, as Rabbi Itzalev Aloshen says, quoted earlier, Zechet Sadik Levroch in the name of his father. As the Baal Shem Tov says, a soul comes down to the world for 70, 80 years to do a favor for one Jew in Gashmias, in physicality, and especially in Ruchnias, in spirituality. I turn today to his dear wife, Ita. The wind beneath his wings, as he always testified. His children, Edna and Yoni, Dina and Nati, and your dear spouses, grandchildren, close friends, relatives, the entire community, the Rabbonim, the Rosh Hashivas, the Askonim, all the Klautur, and all of the men and women, young and old, who are gathered here this evening. And I say to you, Cleveland and the whole Jewish world has been enriched significantly by Mendy Klein's life and soul. Cleveland and the Jewish world have been impoverished profoundly by Mendy Klein's passing and death. There's a void that was created in the heart of this city, a void that some of you know all too personally. The whole Jewish world feels it and senses it because of the impact he had on so many individuals and institutions. And you know, Mendy Klein was colorblind. His tzedakah was colorblind. He didn't see colors. He didn't know if you came from this background or that background, from this persuasion or this walk of life, from this nusach or from this shitta, if you were a Jew, 
you were deserving of his infinite love. His belief was, I don't distinguish between God's children. I don't want people to distinguish between my children. And as you know, Mendi, like Hashem, Veracham of Al he cared for non Jews, for Gentiles. He understood the ultimate vision of Yiddishkeit, Lesaken Oilom, Bemalchus Shindalid Yud. This was not a tunnel vision. This was not a narrow vision. This was an expansiveness. He believed in the Koyach of Torah and Yiddishkeit to change the world, to change the Jewish world, and ultimately to change the world in so many powerful ways. And then, this great rose of the Jewish people was plucked on the day of Lagba Oimer. When a half a million Jews unite in Miron to celebrate with Rab Shimon ben Yechoi, the man who says in Mesachas Sukkah, Yechoi ni lifteres koy lo ilam kuli min adin, I can exempt the whole world from judgment. And Rabbi Akiva Ege there says, I in Ovis de Reb Nosen perik tezayin. And you open up an Ovis de Reb Nosen chapter 16, as Rabbi Akiva Ege says, and you see Rab Shimon says, quite a daring comment. He says, a Jew, Yisrael, ain't on royin. Jews never see the face of Gehenna. So he can exempt the whole world from judgment. Rebecca, what does he mean? What does he mean? Jews don't see Pnei Gehenna. So he gives a metaphor. There was a king who had a lousy field. And nobody can do anything with this field. Nobody. And then a group of people came and they toiled and they plowed and they worked hard and they planted and they produced one core. And the king says, why only one core? He said, really? You're complaining? Do you know what this field looked like before? Nothing. Look what we produced. And the king said, you know what? You're right. So the commentators explained, what was Rav Shemim Ba'yechai saying? The Jewish people have been through so, so much. Everything that we see in every Jew, the Rebbeinu Shaloylam celebrates. Wow! This is amazing after so many thousands of years. So much loyalty, so much dedication, so much love. Mendy Klein could not tolerate when people were put down, when people were denigrated. He despised when people stood up in front of youth and instead of lifting them up, empowering them, inspiring them as the future of Jewish civilization, as those who can take over the world and bring the Dvar Hashem to the whole world. Instead of that, some of us know just how to poke at them, make snidey remarks, make them feel guilty, but the yard site of Mendy Klein is on the day of Lagba Oimer. The Mara, the Pnimius Hatoira. The one who was Megala, the Pnimius Hanashoma of every Jew's Achelek Eloika Mimal. That every single Jewish child and every single Jew, no matter who he or she is, is loved by the Rebbeinu Shaloylam with an infinite, unbreakable, unconditional, unwavering love. That's the love that he emulated. That's the love that he carried. He felt that Gehenna and the Jewish people are two opposites. You're dealing with Babas, Eino Yishol HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and you know you have anybody took ever his pinky and put it into the apple of your eye? You ever felt it? That's what Hashem Kivayochul feels. When I speak down at a Jew, Babas Einoi, Babas Einoi Shalakadosh Baruch Hu, that's what he felt. Yechoyl ni lifter es kaloylam kulim in adin. Love Jews, lift up Jews, and al techtu bayela. Don't forget that one individual child, young in years, or young in meaning, young in physical years, or young. In dignity, in maturity, in spiritual development, in Avas Atoira, Avas Hashem, or Avas Yisrael. The Baal Shem Tev said when somebody dies, you could cry, you could be silent, and you could sing. You can cry for their loss. You could be quiet because there's nothing to say. You can also sing because their song was interrupted 
and you make sure to continue their song. Tonight, we grieve, we cry, and there are really no words. What a shock. Everybody remembers exactly where they were standing when the person told you Mendy Klein returned his soul to its maker and you told the person you're a Meshuggah and you're a certified liar. Suddenly, plucked away to another world. We could be silent. We should be silent because words really will never be eloquent to describe his life, to describe his heart, to describe his love, to describe his qualities, and to describe what he meant for so many of us, especially for his closest family and closest friends. But that's not enough. Mendy would be very upset if that was the conclusion. Tonight is a night when we also have to sing. Sing because Mendy Klein sang. He didn't stop singing. No, I don't mean he had the best voice in the United States. But Ashira Lashem Bechayai, his life was a song. It was a song of celebration, of love, of ideas, of connection, and most importantly, of caring. I know what it says in Sifre Kabbalah. When a father passes away, a piece of his soul gets implanted to each of his children. The Rakachavi explains in Baba Basra, and you say, the Rosh Hashiva says, Mendi is now learning Baba Basra, that Yerusha is not Shinu Yerushus, because Etzem Haben, who Etzem Haav? A piece of your dear father is implanted in each of the child, children, in each of the grandchildren. I can tell you throughout the next few weeks and months, you will feel a certain spiritual presence of your father's soul and love in your hearts, in your life. There is nothing that can replace him. The void will remain till Tchiyas Amesim. But remember this, your father, your grandfather, was not a man who would accept despair, hopelessness, ever. He was the man who said, we're gonna cry, but then we're gonna laugh. We're gonna stand between the dead, but we're gonna stand between the living, because our greatest task is to continue to sing. And when you continue to sing each in your own way, Mendy Klein's song will continue will be perpetuated in the lives of the family, each in your own way, in the lives of the many friends and the many disciples and all of us who have been touched by this great soul during his short, too short journey in this world, by all of the great Torah institutions of Cleveland and throughout the world, by all the institutions of love and kindness in Cleveland, all the world, the yeshivas and the koilalim, the moizdus hachesed, of all the different kehillas, all the different shuls, all the different projects and organizations. Remember the words, Mazaroi Bachayim, Afu Bachayim, and Mesechtatainis, as Cleveland will grow and prosper from strength to strength. Mendy Klein will feel more alive and more alive as his soul will shepnachas from the fact that his dream, his ambition, his declaration, Al Techtu Bayeled, don't forget even one Jewish child, will ultimately saturate and penetrate the entire Jewish world, until that great moment of Hekitsu Viranenu Sheikh Neyafar, for who besoicham bimheira biyameinu amein. Thank you. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.